Good evening. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming, and thank you to Paul, uh, to Paul for inviting me. Uh, I'm Helen Hawkes. I'm head of web archiving at the British Library. Um, I have a small team of eight. Um, we are tasked with the um, onerous um, mission to preserve the UK web. So this evening, I would like to tell you how we do it and also discuss some of the specific aspects attached to this process, including some um, very interesting legal and technical issues. I'll aim to talk for about 40, 45 minutes and leaving plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'm sure you will have plenty. So I'll start by showing you a piece of video which um, should give you really some nice background uh, to what we do. When I press the button, we will begin capturing the digital universe. Thank you very much. And we're going to start archiving the whole of the UK web space and collecting other digital publications as well. By preserving 4.8 million websites, the idea is to help capture what our lives are like now. Where do you begin when you start an archive like this? What do you even start with? Well, uh, this is very much a partnership between the British Library and five other major libraries. We're going to start off with a collection of 4.8 million websites in the .uk domain. About a petabyte of data over the next 10 years, so that's equivalent to 100 terabytes a year. It will be in the form of a digital snapshot of the internet at a point in time so that someone centuries from now will be able to see what life was like in 2013. We're talking about our culture and our heritage here and that's what we exist to preserve. And that's why what's happening here is so important. Right. I hope that gives you a bit of a background um, about what we're trying to do here. Um, it shows how much interest um, the event which took place on the 6th of April uh, has attracted globally. So what happened on the 6th of April is that the UK Parliament passed the secondary regulations for non-print legal deposit. Um, what it means for us is that, as you have seen in the video cl clip, we're going to start, as we have kept books, printed publications for centuries, we're going to start keeping some of, you know, as much as possible, our digital in, uh, heritage. So legal deposit is not something new. How many of you are, uh, are familiar with the concept or the framework? Good. So it's a piece of law which have start, uh, existed hundreds of years. Um, so UK publishers basically are required to submit to the six legal deposit libraries a copy, at least a copy of their publications for long-term preservation. Uh, the Legal Deposit Act was extended in 2003 to include uh, digital publications. Uh, the consequent process to arrive at secondary legislation took about 10 years. So not just the British Library, we're playing a key role in this, but there are it's a collaboration of six UK legal deposit libraries, Bodleian, Cambridge University Library, National Libraries of Wales and Scotland, and the Library of Trinity College. So legal deposit, non-print legal deposit, is not just about websites. Although my team and myself, we concern ourselves with UK websites. So I'm going to cover 
website, archiving of the UK website specifically, but bear, please bear in mind that this is a much wider attempt to collect and preserve our digital publications. And there are very specific aspects or requirements related to the regulations, uh, which we're going to, especially some of the restrictions or control as to how these archived content needs to be used, which we're going to cover later on. Um, and there are, there's going to be a post-implementation review in five years' time. And also there are other issues, you know, related to a dispute procedure, you know, if someone doesn't agree <laughs> for us to archive their, or to, to collect their content, how, how we're going to resolve that problem. So um, the basics about web archiving, um, it's the process of selecting, capturing, storing, preserving, and providing access to snaps, snapshots of websites over time, or copies of websites over time. Um, it's done automatically using web crawlers or spiders, web spiders. Um, search engines use the same software but for a slightly different purpose. They also send out web crawlers to crawl, copy text from, uh, from, from the web and index them. Um, but what we do is that we keep them and we, so, so they were also interested in images, um, videos, and things which are not just text-based. Um, there are different ways of doing web archiving, and archived content is typically brought together in a web archive, which I'm going to show you an example of. Um, this activity, or the realization of website being important and needs to be kept uh, for long-term preservation, I think started in the mid-1990s, uh, by an individual called Bruce Tokayo, who is the owner or founder of the Internet Archive in the U.S. Um, they, to, this, to, to date, I think, uh, possess or have, have the most um, comprehensive and, um, web archive, including uh, the earliest uh, content on the web. Um, there are a lot of us archiving the web. There are heritage and memory organizations like us. In the UK, you know, the, the, the other national libraries and national archives are all engaged in web archiving. And there are university libraries in the US and around the world um, involved in archiving the web. The Internet Archive and other not-for-profit not and commercial organizations, there are also individual researchers who archive specific websites for their own research purpose. Um, as to why, I think you probably can appreciate uh, the reason behind it. I think the fact that uh, the UK has passed the um, non-print legal deposit law to support us doing this is a confirmation of how important it is as a national heritage. So that's the background out of the way. <laughs> so what do we do when we have a website? We send out the crawler periodically take snapshots of a website. What you see here is the um, instances of the British Library's corporate website, which we have archived since 1995. To my knowledge, this instance is the earliest instance of an archived web, uh, website in the world. Uh, the interesting thing in here is a audio recording of a Nightingale, which I regard as the earliest Twitter on the web. So this is a typical web archive user interface. You know, you can look at different snapshots of an individual website over time and go into it and browse page by page. So um, what we, we actually started archiving the web since 2004, but without the blessing of the legal framework, or non-print legal deposit, we can only selectively archive UK website, and we had to um, request permission from the IPR holders prior to archiving the website. That's very time-consuming, and it's all, uh, also very costly. As a result, uh, we only managed to selectively archive about 14,000 websites 
in the Open UK Web Archive, which uh, I'm going to show you later on. So it's a small selected collection of UK websites started since 2004. Since April 2013, because of the non-print legal deposit being in place, we are allowed to, for the first time, to crawl or to archive the UK web at scale without having to ask permissions uh, in advance. Um, the um, condition or the caveat is that um, the archived content, legal report content, is only available for access within the six libraries' reading rooms. What that means is to see what we have archived, you have to be physically present. You have to sit for three hours on the train to go to London or somewhere else, if that's short. So, yes, I see. you're frowning. We'll talk about it later as to why this is um, required. So the, the regulation says everything that uses a UK domain name is in scope. That's really easy from a technical point of view. Everything which is .uk is in scope or whatever comes uh, along, .london, .wales, what have you. That's all included and it's very easy to discover and to identify. The tricky bit is the second part which says where part of the publishing process takes place in the UK. How do you technically implement that at scale? So I'll tell you what we do, but it, none of, you know, it's a mixed bag of manual and semi-automatic processes, none of which is scalable, but you know, if you have better ways of helping us or identifying um, websites in scope, which meet that requirement, I'd be very happy to hear from you. And also, we the legislation says we're not going to archive sites containing concerning film and recorded sound where the audiovisual content predominates. Again, how do you implement that? <laughs> you know, uh, I guess what that says is like, don't touch YouTube. And private intranets and emails. Okay, that's clear. What we we're, we're not supposed to do. The .uk domain or the UK web domain is the fourth largest top level domains after .com, .de and .net. Last December, Nominet, which is .uk registrar, registered 10 million .uk domain names. So I'm only talking about the first bit in scope for legal deposit. So how do we archive something of such massive scale. So here is our collection strategy. Once or twice a year, we aim to do a very broad sweep of all the, um, you, all the websites we identify, which we can identify as in scope, including the UK domain names and the non.uk's. And this really is to preserve a broad impression or a snapshot of the UK web at domain level. We know just by doing that, we're going to miss a lot of important changes on individual websites. In order to address that uh, limitation, we also um, crawl additional content on top of the domain crawl. For example, we're going to look at uh, selected key websites. These are determined by curators which re they regard as of importance to research or um, cultural heritage. For example, um, you know, a curator uh, in, in computing science would select the BCS website. Um, someone doing medical research would probably select Wellcome Trust website, so you get the gist of that. So it's a selected set of key websites. And also we intend to uh, crawl more regularly the news website, content news on the web by journalistic organizations in this country. We know the news website refreshes very frequently, so we need to crawl them more frequently as well, just to capture uh, what's been published. Um, so in addition to that, we also carry out so-called focus crawls related to uh, events of national interest. So if we were to do this last year, 
we would have crawled around the Olympic Games, the Diamond Jubilee. Very recently, we did a focus crawl or a special collection to bring together uh, content on the web related to Nelson Mandela. So by using a mixed strategy, trying to crawl the UK web in width or in breadth and in depth, uh, we do our best to preserve um, a snapshot of the UK domain. So the end-to-end -end process uh, from selecting websites to in for crawling to providing access in the reading rooms is quite complex. Um, I don't intend to go into that step by step, but if you have questions later on, I can answer um, you know, uh, what you would like to know. I would like to report briefly about the progress so far. So we, the first crawl we undertook was the focus crawl around the uh, NHS reform, which took place last year. I think um, about 750 websites went offline, which related to various NHS, NHS, NHS primary trust, uh, care trusts, and other organizations. And there was also a lot of reflection on the web, blogs, uh, tweets, and you know, uh, discussion forums. We tried to capture that all together to, pre, you know, to, to represent uh, the reflection on the web, web related to that um, administrative change at national scale. We also undertook our first UK uh, domain crawl, which lasted 10 weeks. We collected uh, 3.8 million uh, websites, or we identified 3.8 million active hosts, um, to be more precise. So in the video, you heard the figure 4.8 million, and that's our estimate. We did some test crawls, and we identified 4.8 million URLs, or you know, seeds, what we call the starting point of a crawl. But in reality, once we've done our uh, real domain crawl, we identified 3.8 million active hosts. We collected about 1.4 billion URLs, and that is about 31 terabytes compressed data. I think the compression rate is about 40%. So <laughs> if you do the math, I think 100 terabytes per year isn't really that much off the mark. And on our going, ongoing basis as we speak, on a daily basis, we're crawling these key websites and also 500 plus news websites. And all these websites don't necessarily have the same frequency. Uh, the frequency really is chosen based on the refresh rate of the site itself. So on any given day, there will be some crawling activity going on in the background. So when you start crawling a national domain, you get the big pictures. So we, I, I think over time, we'll be able to do a lot of, you know, to collect such statistics and do comparison, which I think will be really interesting. Um, I chose uh, two uh, graphs to show you uh, just preliminary, you know, our preliminary understanding of the UK domain based on our limited crawling activity. This initial one shows the distribution of the data volume related to the, the hosts we have identified. Um, you can see that there are a lot of websites with very, very little data, more than 200,000 domains, which is about six, 64 bytes. That's really insignificant. This could be sites that return, uh, no con you know, contain no content at all, or these could be redirections to elsewhere, or indeed parked domains. You know, we have identified over 10,000 domains hosted on one IP address. So <laughs> we, we have a way to deal with them. We don't want to annoy those people. If you hammer the sites too much, they'll get really annoyed, you can imagine. So, and looking at the graph, at the other end of the scale, um, there is probably about you know, close to 550,000 websites, which return at least 250 megabytes of data or more. So uh, we actually do, add, we have a list of the 
the massive site. Um, BBC.co.uk is one of them. And this, the second graph uh, shows the um, distribution of URLs. So on each identified active domain, how many pages or URLs re is related, hosted under that domain. Uh, this is probably a more reasonable or a flatter, more flatter distribution if you look at the number of URLs. So that is what we have done so far. And our next domain crawl, which we're uh, plan uh, planning, will take place uh, in end, you know, end April, May-ish. And we expect to collect more websites using a non-UK domain name or non-UK domain name. Now I'm going to look into a few aspects related to uh, archiving the UK web. First one I would like to discuss is how we, in, what is UK? So we said the legislation is very clear uh, in, in first instance, which says everything uses .uk domain name is in scope. That is very easy to identify. Um, but then the trick of it, like I said, this is a wording taken from the legislation, is, um, you know, a work published online is considered to be UK if it's made available to the public by a person or any of that person's activity relating to the creation or the publication of the work take place within the United Kingdom. So we thought of a few things which we do to implement or to, to check UK territoriality. So um, for the .uk ones, we had a list assembled using various sources. We did different, you know, various test crawls, just scooping or collecting the first, the slash level um, content, slash page level content, the first page of a, of a website. And then we look at the links embedded on that page and we put them all together in a list and then we crawl them again, we test. And we also got some help from online databases, from the Internet Archive. So, and th there were also, you know, um, manually se selected non.uk domains, which our curators are aware of. For example, Amnesty International has two websites, amnesty.org.uk and amnesty.org. One's the international branch, one's the UK branch. So there are curators working at the libraries who are aware of such you know, key websites who manually selected some of them. In terms of the non.uk websites, in the statistics I just showed you, they mostly contain .uk ones. Uh, the non.uk ones weren't in there because when we started our first domain crawl, we have barely had time to implement some of these uh, methods to identify a non.uk website. So, for example, we have um, added a module to uh, our crawler software, which during the crawl process, when, they, when it comes across a non.uk URL, it checks the um, IP location in the background, and if it's you know, using an external database, if it returns, um, the re result returns um, is um, UK based, then that URL is added to the list to be fetched. Um, so in that way, we identify non.uk website. Uh, recently, we also uh, added the Who's lookup. Um, unfortunately, we haven't found a service, web service, or a based service where we can query uh, in the, at scale. So it's, um, we can do the automatic check in the background, but there are limitations as to how many lookup you can do. Uh, so that's, I think, a bit semi-automated. So we look specifically at the registrant's address. If it's based in the UK, then that website or that domain is in scope. <laughs> we also um, use a few manual processes, leaving, uh, for example, checking the postal address on the contact page on our website, uh, which is accurate, of course, but it doesn't scale. 
And sometimes we have organizations or publishers co corresponding with our curators, or our curators know about those publishers. So they, if we have corresponded and have evidence to support uh, this um, you know, um, assessment, then they're considered to be UK as well. And sometimes there are cases where you know a website is UK-based, for example, the British Computing Society, which uses the domain name bcs.org. I spend a long time trying to find a UK address on the BCS website. There isn't one, but we all know it's UK-based. So based on my professional judgment, I considered this as in scope. But some of these manual criteria it's really not going to scale up. So, you know, we can spend a lot of time trying to identify these websites, but you wouldn't end up um, archiving that portion of the UK web, which is considered in scope at scale at all. So that's how we implement or check what is uh, considered UK. And moving on to how we crawl the web more specifically, uh, we use a software called Heratrix. It's an open source software initially developed by the Internet Archive. Anyone who has used this or aware, heard about it? Okay, so I'll, I'll just go through it a little bit more uh, quickly. So we run multiple instances of this crawler software. Uh, which is capable of having 200 HTTP connections per instance simultaneously. So what I'm trying to say is uh, using a powerful, a beefy server running multiple instances, we could collect or copy website, many websites um, in a, at the same time. I think um, the, the highest throughput we vit witnessed was a single instance visiting 857 URLs per second. Uh, we pulled down about one terabyte of data at some point uh, on a single day. <laughs> a, consequence of, a consequence of that is everything else is not keeping up, the virus checking process, the other processes. Um, okay, so in addition to Heratrix, we also use other modules and systems to help uh, render website, for example, to interpret JavaScript. JavaScript um, are tricky in that it depends on some sort of um, interaction or interpretation so to arrive to, to lead you to the content you're looking for. Um, so with the help of a headless browser called Phantom J JS, um, we are able to interpret and discover additional URLs. As a result, when we crawl a website, we'll be able to crawl that web website uh, more comprehensively if it's JavaScript heavy. Otherwise, if you just rely on Heratrix, you'll miss a lot of content. So um, in the crawling process, we're also building virus checking. So we actually found quite a, a bit of viral content in the domain crawl. And these are stored, but digitally manipulated. Um, not, and not made available in the reading rooms. And robots.txt, anyone familiar with that? Okay, so you must have, you, if you followed news, you've probably heard about the conservatives trying to modify the robots.txt on their website and trying to remove the speeches by them, David Cameron, trying to re, re, you know, erase history. To be fair, the fact that um, the, ch the, the fact that they have changed the robots.txt on their live website, which led to Internet Archive not servicing the relevant record, is purely, I think, a fluke rather than conspiracy. They wouldn't have known, but <laughs> that's how Internet Archive work. They check robots.txt in real time to determine whether they provide access to an archived content. Because the conservatives changed their robots to exclude the speeches by David Cameron, 
and remove them from the live website when someone tries to access those pages in, in the Internet Archive, Internet Archive contacts the Conservative Party's website in real time and saw the robot's uh, exclusion and decide that's not something they said. So that's what really happened. Anyway, but the question really is why did they do that in the first place? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, it's not a legal um, requirement. It's a protocol, but um, I think it's etiquette, good practice you follow. So by default, we follow robots' exclusions, uh, but there are some exceptions. For example, if we reach mutual agreement, for example, with the bbc.co.uk, so that we can crawl and collect all the content on their website, then we ignore robots. And also we ignore robots for, the, for all the home pages and embedded content, for example, style sheets and certain images. Otherwise, you make a copy of a website with a lot of holes on it. You know, at least you should get a reasonable copy of a home page of a website. That's why we ignore robots for the, all the um, seat pages. Um, we just looked at the graph you know, showing the distribu distribution of uh, content. You have a big bunch at the, you know, at one end with very little content, but there is also a long tail with a lot of content, massive websites. So we need to make a decision as to what's the average size we're going to allow per website which we collect. Uh, because if you do not set limit, you're going to use up your machine resources, you know, the service we're not going to keep up and all that. So we did various test crawls and determined that the cap or limitation per host of 512 megabytes is the best um, to cover the UK domain. That actually covers about 85% of the known hosts we have identified. So we still need to make a decision about the large size, but that really is a curatorial judgment. If a curator thinks a website is of certain importance, for example, bbc.co.uk, they can make a case for us not to limit the amount of data we collect from that host, for example. Um, so I talked about the parked domains. So when one IP address hosts so many uh, you know, hosts, large number of hosts is served by one single IP address, if you use the, your standard uh, crawl configuration or polite, you know, politeness configuration, you're going to annoy that host. You're going to crawl the website too aggressively. So in, in cases like that, we actually change the configuration. We crawl the site in a more uh, gentle way. So the gap between the requests we sent to the um, web service is increased. Um, so we talked about the, um, uh, some of the limitations from a you know, legal point of view, but there are also technical limitations. The crawling technology at the moment is not adequate enough for us to make 100% replicas of the website. Uh, we always miss content, you know, JavaScript-based website, uh, dynamically generated website, um, the deep web, you know, database-driven website. We actually miss quite a lot of content. Um, therefore, quality assurance is necessary. Uh, before we before non-print legal deposit, when we did um, selective archiving, because we dealt with very small numbers, rel you know, re relatively, uh, we were able to put more human effort into checking uh, the website by looking at, you know, uh, how the website, archived website, replaces, you know, how, you know, doing visual comparison of the archived copy and the live website to see what's missing, then we go back, reconfigure, and recrawl the website. But when you deal with 3.8 million hosts or 4 million websites, you can't really do that sort of manual um, 
quality assurance anymore. So what we've done is we have developed a system uh, looking at crawl time events, you know, looking at statistics and metrics for, you know, generated by the crawler, which may have impact on the quality of an archived website, and to make that information available through a web-based interface um, to help us generate, you know, making sure that there's reasonable, that the quality of the archived websites are of reasonable level. So I think this may be too detailed. Uh, what you need to know is that um, we, this system, Monitrix, talks with the crawler in real time and graphically present the key statistics or information which have impact on the quality of the crawl for us to monitor and identify problems. So for example, this bit, we probably reasonably can conclude that we had network outage there because nothing, it's a flat line, nothing has been collected for a duration of time. And it also tells us, um, you know, per host, how much data is collected, when did it start, and how many URLs has been collected. If you look at these statistics, a crawl of a certain, the crawl of a certain host, if it started like a week ago, and the number, of, the, the number of URLs being collected tend to be flat, you know you have probably hit some sort of crawler trap. So you're in a loop. You're not getting anything new back. So that's probably time to intervene and check what's going on. So what this system does is to help us visualize the key metrics which have impact on quality and for us to take actions in a timely manner. I don't know if this is really interesting to you, um, but 1.4 billion um, URLs and to provide search and access to 31 terabytes of data is a massive challenge. I think I'll be uh, brief about this. Um, all you need to know is that we use um, a techno technology called Solar. It's a leucine-based indexing technology. And we use a number of um, systems and tools to provide access to archived web content. Um, they're stored in a file format called WARCs, which is the ISO standard. And um, the, her the crawler writes collected content in that format. We deconstruct it, extract the text, and pass it on for Solar um, to generate index on a Hadoop cluster. Again, some of you will be familiar with that. It's a redundant um, distributed um, processing system. I think um, that's really uh, the sort of tool we have to rely on when you deal with big data of this size. And we use, um, you know, also uh, something called a CDX index, which really works together with a rendering software to find the website which comes up in the search results. So I'll, I can cover this in more detail if people are uh, interested. I think this probably is something uh, you'll be shocked, perhaps, to hear. In order to balance public interest and um, the risk of harming publishers' business models, so a publisher, newspaper publisher might want to uh, generate revenue from archival content, past content. So if we crawl them, you know, based uh, on the non-print legal deposit, legislation and provide open access to it, it will be, it, it is regarded as harmful to some of the publishers. So in exchange, there is control, very specific control on how the legal deposit content is supposed to be used. 
because uh, the argument behind that is that this is really for long-term preservation rather than a real-time repository for access. So what that means is, as I mentioned previously, you have to be physically present in one of the legal deposit library's reading rooms to see the content we have archived. And on top of that, the current legal deposit, non-print legal deposit presentation, uh, pres uh, regulation is based on a piece of law which has existed for a long time. There are certain principles which this, the, the, the extended regulation cannot um, disobey. For example, there is a requirement in terms of uh, concurrent access. Only single concurrent access is allowed per library. I think the rationale behind it, I'm trying very hard <laughs> to understand, behind it is that uh, pre previously with printed books and publications, you can't physically lend one book to two people, I think. Hence, the two people cannot look at the same web page at the same time. So you have to go to the library physically and you can't look at the same page at the same time. So actually to implement single concurrent access is actually, it's not easy at all if you think how we need to coordinate that across six locations. So that was quite a challenge. And I think we use a HTML5 compatible environment called Ericom, which promote, uh, you know, provides a remote session, desktop session, on the server in the reading rooms. That's how, and there is a locking mechanism. So when a URL is requested by a user, based on um, someone, you get a message telling you that you can't look at that because it's in use, come back later. And you can only see it when the previous session has ended. You know what I'm talking about. However, I think we recognize that um, this requirement is necessary by law. We have to comply with it. I think there was, uh, again, in the news a few weeks ago, I mean, it, it is, it's seen as ironic that the UK's Internet Archive is actually not on the Internet. But uh, we implement law. Um, any feedback any we have will be passed on to the government when the review of that regulation takes place in five years' time. In the meantime, um, we thought we probably need to think about the archiving activities took place prior to non-print legal deposit and how important it is that some of these archived content is publicly available. So, for example, when everybody was panicking about the uh, David Cameron speeches not being available from the Internet Archive, we actually have archived 59 copies of the uh, Conservative Party's website, openly available on the, in the UK Web Archive, and uh, including those speeches. So, it does show how important it is that some, at least some of them is available. So we carried out, we did our homework, we looked at the risks related to making some of this content available on top of non-print legal deposit. Uh, so we have decided that we will provide online access to some of this content, especially uh, metadata and some of the selected content to showcase the legal deposit UK web archive to at least show people when the websites are no longer on the live website, you know, where they can find them. So we're going to make available bibliographical metadata, metadata about websites, and we're also going to visualize the analytics related to based on aggregated content, i.e. not showing individual website as it is, or allow people to identify individual websites, but we're going to tell you about what we have archived, the big pictures about the UK web and other aspects, and the statistical data, the contextual data, and if people are happy, for example, if BCS 
is happy and give us a, give, to give us a license to provide access of the archived version of their website beyond the reading rooms, we'll be very happy to do so. So this is how we address that issue uh, at the same time also uh, comply with the legal requirements. Uh, we're also going to allow the archiving of website which are not in scope for non-print legal deposit, uh, but that should be permission-based, both for harvesting and for public access. So I just mentioned um, analytics and visualization. Previously, I showed you the archived copies of the British Library website, which really is the, the access method shown, being on show here is quite linear. You look at different versions of an individual website, you go into each one of them, you click on one of them, and, um, you know, it, it's not very different from looking at a um, printed book, really. So, for example, here is the copies of the website we have archived of Amnesty International UK. So, on these thumbnails, you could already see the significant changes related to the user interface design. And a conventional way of using archived website is you go into it. Oh, please work. And you click on these links. You know, here we have lost the style sheets. For some reason, I can see, but most of the content is there. You come across that sort of problems uh, all the time, but hopefully... Now, most of the time, you should, um, it should function as it is. Oh, I'm not sure what's happening here. It could be that we have stumbled onto a text version. No, we have lost this. We haven't captured the style sheet in this specific copy, for example. So this is how a website normally are archived, which requires providing access to the work as it is, and you will be able to identify the individual websites. So we thought, actually, when you have all millions of websites together, if you look at, take a step back, and shift the focus from the level of the single web, web pages or website to the entirety of the web archive collection, there is a lot of embedded patterns and trends and knowledge which has not been discovered before. So we should focus on using the web archive as a data set and try to use some of the computational based method to look at analytics and visualization. And also we think it is possible to provide access to such information and data outside the reading rooms. And that will not only help us to comply with the regulations, but also um, demonstrate the value and allow researchers to use archived web in a different way. So we can look at some of the work we've done. I think this is really best illustra illustrated by an example here. So this is how the UK web or UK websites were linked to each other in 1996. So what I haven't mentioned so far, so I mentioned the Open UK Web Archive, the very small collection we have, selective collection, permission-based. I mentioned our Legal Deposit Web Archive, uh, enabled by non-print Legal Deposit regulations. Um, we actually have a third data set, which is largest um, in our care so far. This is the extracted UK website from the Internet Archives collection since 1996. It's about, I think about 57 terabytes. So we have, we use this as a research testbed to explore big data based approach to web archive collections. So um, because this is um, the terms allowed attached to this um, research data set by the Internet Archive and also who, the founder who enabled this, which is JISC, 
uh, Joint Information Systems Committee. I think many of you may be um, aware who they are. So we started releasing derivative data sets based on this one as open data. And a researcher or developer in Austria called Rainer Simon took a portion of this data set we released on GitHub and did some analysis uh, looking at the 1996 portion of that data set, looking at the number of hosts and the host-to-host -host links and generated this diagram. So to me, it's very interesting to see this because, um, you know, no doubt that first analysis uh, is required to identify all the clusters and, you know, uh, further uh, relationships. But this unlabeled overview immediately tells me um, a very in important aspect of web archiving. So the dots around the edges in the graph indicate individual hosts that are in the UK domain but are not connected to many other hosts in the center. As, and, and some of them are not connected at all. I think what this implies is uh, in order to, complete, to comprehensively archive the UK web, we actually have to see the UK web as part of the global web. If we only focus on the known UK hosts, we're going to miss what's on the edge. They are in scope. But the way we're crawling the web means that we won't identify them. So um, this also illustrates a bit of a problem. This is only the 1996 portion of the 50-odd terabytes. Um, it's already so crowded, you can't examine the individual nodes. <laughs> Imagine 57 terabytes or, you know, visualizing our data in five years' time. Where do you go? Where do you put the dots and crosses? So I think there are limits or scalability issues um, related to large data sets over time as well. So the, the user interface design, the access remain a challenge. Um, this is, um, I think I'll, I'll just quickly tell you what this is. So I mentioned that the British Library is not the only organization archiving the web. As a matter of fact, uh, I think I'm aware of about 30 web archives at least in the world. But the problem is that I, um, so my remit is the UK web. The French National Library is interested in the French web, the Danish in Danish web. But when you use the web, when you go to the live web and research something, I don't think you care that much where the website is hosted, whether it's French or Danish or UK, as long as you can read and understand what it's saying and as long as it's relevant to your research. So this actually illustrates a problem the currently, currently, that the currently the archive web is dispersed and not connected. And that's what the Memento service is for. It helps you to connect the distributed web archives together. So without going into the details, I think um, this is a nice and neat service we have developed as part, it's on the UK website. Um, so going back to the conservatives website at the time, if the journalist knew, the Guardian journalist who contacted us and the other journalist knew about this service, they could just go to this website and type conservatives.com and then you'll see a representation or a you'll find out information related to which web archive in the world has archived conservative parties website. So uh, you can get to the individual instances, you can find out graphically when and how many instances they have archived. For example, to my surprise, the National Library of Iceland has you know, <laughs> archived the Conservative Party's website, and also the, the um, Library of the Czech Republic, for example. So in case you, know, you discover that the copies of da David Cameron's speech is offline at the Internet Archive, you can go to the other archives, or at least you can find out who have copies 
of that website. You know, sometimes uh, these archives have similar legal requirements, requires you to be there physically, but at least you have metadata about them. So this is um, what we're trying to do to link to other web archives and also to provide access to archived content uh, while trying to be, uh, you know, while complying with the legal requirements. So I think um, I'm, I've covered a various aspects related to archiving the web. Uh, some of them might be some of you might be familiar, others, to others it might sound quite um, alien, what we are trying to do. It is quite uh, complex what we're trying to do, and it's not always easy to comprehend or to understand uh, the details. But what we uh, know is that we only started um, addressing the challenge of preserving the UK web. We still have a lot of work to do. Uh, so I've listed some, uh, for example, uh, at this point, up to date, I don't think we have found a scalable solution just yet to identify the in-scope content which does not use a .uk domain name or UK domains, domain names. And the problem of, of advanced content, you know, streaming media, <laughs> JavaScript heavy, database driven, the deep web, we haven't even touched those. We can't collect them. They're going to be lost. And also the user experience. You know, people are, users are used to search using Google to look at videos streamed to their browser uh, to access everything on the live web. Uh, when they go to the UK web archive, legal deposit or open UK web archive, they look at the archived content being flattened, deconstructed, and interactions taken away. How do we deal with the disappointment? Or how do we explain to users why web archives are like that? We also need better monitoring software. You know, the real-time monitoring software I showed you worked really well when we did the smaller crawls, but it actually fell over. When we did our big domain crawl, the backend database is not coping, so we're actually changing over the backend database uh, to make it more scalable. We, we need better rendering engines so that we can make sure we archive uh, websites more comprehensively. And I think on top of all that, the real challenge is actually not technical. It's the business processes related to doing this. Uh, we're no longer working within our small team of eight. We're talking about uh, working with other teams in the library, other libraries, other countries, so the interaction and complexity just increased um, and reached a different level. And we have to adapt our tools. All the software, software tools we used in the past needs to be changed, redeveloped, revamped to meet our needs. And also um, a whole range of new business processes to deal with our undertaking. So we just started and there's still a lot of work to do. So I think I'll just end there and leave you, you know, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to raise them. Thank you.